the Triple Frio with Hutchie, Richo and RS Die. It's Hong Kong Racing with the blinkers off. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a brand new edition of the Triple Trio. Looking forward to a huge weekend of racing at Chart 10 and also looking back in a breathtaking Group 1. And we do it with the best team in the business. Clint Hutchison, our form guru, Hutchies Honkers, and also Hall of Fame jockey in Shane Dye. Hutchie, welcome to another show. Now, the true Australian style, we don't like to pump up our mates. <laughs> But allow me to do this with a very heavy heart. You were magnificent with Straight Aaron. Well done. No, it was a nice result last week. And we've had a good uh, we've had a good week, haven't we? But this was a really good performance uh, from Straight Aaron last week. Got held up in a bit of traffic. It was looking ugly at this point. And, uh, Breathe in. Yeah, a little shift around from Nicholson returns, and he darted through. Well done to Casper Founds. Good result for our subs. He was really well back late, and uh, obviously now potentially on that derby path. Uh, it's good to see him produce some of his Australian form, and Shane's been singing the horse's praises, so I'm sure he was pretty bored. We'll catch up with Shane in a moment. And, of course, uh, snow a lot for David Hayes and Lyle Hewitson during the week was another good result. But, like I said, the weekend was good, little profit. We had the same, of course, on Wednesday. So we want to mm. keep that momentum going, and we've got a lot to get through on the show. We've got a lot to dissect. Of last weekend, obviously, the yeah. Gold 60 Romantic Warrior and uh, we're looking forward as well a little bit to the Whirlpool Super Saturday in Dubai as well. Yeah, looking forward to that. So we've got some special guests, which I'll outline in a moment. Uh, RSDI, as always, a pleasure. My friend, uh, what an epic Sunday of racing last week. Fantastic. Wasn't it a great race, the main race? The whole day's racing was good. Um, threw up some nice horses for the future. Profit or no profit for RSDI? Last Sunday. I can't even remember. I know Wednesday night I was square. I've got to go back. I forget things, mate, now. I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon you just go to the freezer and see how much cash you got in there. That's how you check to see how you went last week. I'll tell you hey, what, mate. I played poker during the week. It's a little bit lighter this week. <laughs> oh, okay, we finally found something he's not good at. We mm -hmm. might have to try to take him on at poker. He'll probably beat us about that. We're going to burst out of the gates at the moment. Lots to talk about. Also, uh, we love what Hutchie's done in for go looking for future winners. We do that with our sweet in defeat file. Jane casts his eye over all the rides for genius or slaughter. We have got a, a star power guest with a difference. Is uh, Nicole Purton's going to be pre reviewing and then previewing what's coming mm. up uh, in Hong Kong? And of course, her husband Zach rides in Sydney on Saturday before jetting back to Hong Kong. For Sunday, and Damien Lane, who had a Group 3 win in Saudi Arabia, is going to be another of our guests, plus a stack of tips. Stay with us. We're going to burst out of the gates. We're going to burst out of the gates with a big story that's been evolving over the last couple of weeks, and that has been Zach Purton and comments he made, and also in regards to Chief Steward Mark Van Gestel, and a big fine comes to Zach. Yeah, we spoke about it last on last week's show, and um, since that show, of course, uh, they have issued a fine, a substantial fine to Zach, but li listening to what he said in his comments to the press subsequently, he knew that he was going to be fined, as I'm sure he, he would have, uh, knowing what he said. and. Hopefully they work it all out, Shane. But um, yeah, he's obviously copped it and thought um, he deserved it. Apparently, that's I think I'm quoting him when he said that. And no real surprise. I think when you're, and you know, as we said last week, we're in this sort of sports and you make uh, those sorts of comments. That's they're gonna they're gonna probably look at it that way. So hopefully they can work it all out going forward, or it's uh, put behind them anyway. It'd be put behind them. They'll work it out. It was, he was always going to get fined. That's not a surprise. It's like water off a duck, duck's back. It's forgot. I, I I wouldn't even worry about it. It's history. Uh, they'll move on. Um, I see he's got another one he's got to fight, but I've got no idea what that one was about with Derek Leon. Yeah, well, he pleaded not guilty on that one, but copped a, an extra fine there. Uh, a doubles on Wednesday night, uh, Shane and Hutch to Lyle Hewitson and Karis Teton. Um, uh, Karis uh, riding well. Here's Lyle Hewitson in action, Shane. This is a good win, this first run for a while, and a good training performance, actually, Clint, this. He was quite impressive. He was. Um, I find him a hard horse to catch. And he, when he's right, he can do this. And um, it's, maybe he's better after a break. But Douglas and uh, Lyle teaming up, and that was a nice performance. And Lyle's um, won well. And this is, of course, Karras winning on a horse. This race rated well. How deep is your love? They really rolled along. John Sides had another couple of winners with some nice progressive horses. And 
He was very well back, Shane. He started, what, a dollar sixty, but you probably never had a worrying moment either. I had him that price. He couldn't get beat from his last run from the gate. He was always going to box seat, and his last run was sensational. He got checked at the 150, and he still finished off. He, he just couldn't get beat in that, so the price didn't surprise me. Talking about gun jockeys, uh, let's reflect on a moment on the achievement of Zach Purton, uh, the Aussie superstar based in Hong Kong. For the eighth season, he gets 100 winners. To put into, into uh, context, so Douglas White and Joe Marrera are the only two to achieve it. It's the second fastest to 100 chain. Um, he is riding at the peak of his powers. Big effort, huge effort, and he does it with weight also, so he can't ride lightweighted horses, so he misses out on a lot of winners. It's, it's an incredible feat. He's done so good, so well, I should say, there. Interesting that they they originally, I think, thought that it might be the quickest 100 yeah. ever because there was being compared to Joe's season the year that he broke the record, but Joe actually got to 100 quicker the year before that but never got to that mark. Right, okay. So we all watch with great interest to see if Zach can uh, sort of eclipse that 170 winner mark and he's on track. Well, that's right. So he charges towards 170. Wouldn't it be appropriate if he was able to steal that record, which is – Absolutely perfect segue because we're going to get the inside running. And when we do that, there's only one person we want to chat to from the Purton family. It's Nicole. Inside running with Nicole Purton. Uh, Nick, always an absolute pleasure to catch up with you. We're not catching up with you in Hong Kong, though. You're sitting in beautiful, sunny Sydney. Is that right? I am. Hi, guys. Uh, it's actually not as sunny as I'd like. It was beautiful here yesterday, but today we've had a huge downpour this morning, so oh, it's not the welcome I wanted, but I'll just make do with it, hey? <laughs> we love having you on the show, mate. It, tell us, what was it like on Sunday, that atmosphere in the build-up to Romantic Warrior versus Golden Six? That race, actually, you know, the day as a whole was was awesome, but that race in particular was really exciting. I mean, Zach didn't actually even have a ride in the race, but, um, you know, I I like to see the champion win. And during the run, watching Golden 60, I actually, look, maybe you disagree, but I was thought he was being pushed along a little bit, so I wasn't sure what to expect in the straight. But when he's locked on to Romantic Warrior and then ran him down, like the crowd was just going off. And it reminded me of probably what you guys experienced with Winx, you know, throughout her career. Like he's our champ, he's our Winx. And it was just awesome to see him get up and win. And I must admit I got a little bit carried away. I hope there's no footage of me cheering away like an idiot. But, no, it was awesome. It was a great day. Hey, Shane, there was moments here where I, it looked like Vincent Ho was either A, trying to wake him up, or B, scrub him along. Which, how did you see it? I saw this race as the coming of age of Vincent. He realised what I was saying three weeks or three runs ago, um, how you don't ride to percentages. And you have to gamble. And he gambled in this race out of the gates and went forward. And he wouldn't normally do that. So sometimes it's a blessing to get beat. When he got beat on him three starts ago and he rode to percentages, and I kept saying why he got beat, you got to gamble to win big races. And it's like a boy becoming a man. And that's what Vincent's done. He's finally realised how you win big races. Uh, Karras rode his perfectly. He did nothing wrong. He could not win the race once they went fast out of the straight into the back and they got going. He needed a slow run race where he could take off and he did nothing wrong. Um, the best horse won. He's just a class above them, this horse. He's better than this horse. He's better than California Spangle. And now Vincent realises that if he can stay in touch with these horses and not let them get away, he's going to beat them. It's as simple as that. He's just too good. Yeah, fantastic race. And he, and he was too good on the day. Um, romantic, where well, I agree, Karras has lost the right apparently by all reports. Oh, really? Since that, that's what's being reported. But um, that's interesting in itself. I thought he didn't do anything wrong either. But the, the qualities of Golden 60 to knuckle down like he did, actually, we might have a, a, a sort of a close-up of that final 100 metres because I want to show where he changes leads. You can see sort of getting there, getting there. You'll see in a few strides there. He just he changes legs in that final 50, 75. He knows where the post is. Oh. And Vincent had him there close enough, but he just wanted to win. And uh, what a performance. 
I'll say this though. Um, you know, he was too good on the day, and he is a winner. Shane, I'm not sure that Romantic Warrior quite went to his level for me. His two best rated performances are International Cup, of course, when when J Mac was aboard back in December, he went about three lengths better, and of of course, then his Derby win of last year. And I suppose that some line can be drawn through Money Catcher running as well as he did as he did amongst others. They haven't really busted the rest of them um, open by yeah. a big margin, so. I think it's quite easy, and those numbers are backed up by other rivals in the race. But that isn't taking nothing away from Golden Sixty. He's got there and he's won his race. But I just don't think we saw the absolute best out of Romantic Warrior. That's interesting, and it's also interesting your point about uh, a new jockey, Nicole. What, what are we hearing in regards to a new jockey for a ma- Romantic Warrior? Yeah, that's right. He will have a new jockey next start. I don't believe the camps made a definitive decision on which jockey, but I know James McDonald, Zach Purton and Hugh Hugh Bowman's names have been thrown in the hat. Um, But as I said, we'll just have to stand by and wait and see who they they decide to go with. So James McDonald has that association who coming to ride during the international meeting. Hey, Shane, you touched on something last week where you said for all these major races, the market in a in the head to head has been wrong. The market's been getting it wrong. It happened again. They've got it wrong every time, whether it be the sprint or this. Now, I got the boys to put this up. Have a look at this. First time, Golden sixty two, a, go, a California Spangle dollar sixty gets beat. Reverse the next time, three twenty he wins. So the last two starts, Golden sixty hasn't started favourite. The other horse has. He's beat him fair and square every time. They, they, they get it wrong. They get it wrong. Simple as that. Isn't that interesting? Uh, the market goes with Golden 60 when he doesn't win and then goes against him. And But yeah. to be fair, taking your point, he, he's not being uh, – the favourite on that occasion is a horse who's like – Seriously, only just been narrowly beaten. He's a good horse. Oh, anyway. Romantic Warriors. Does yeah. he, has he been running to the level that we saw that captured our buddy attention at international league? We spoke up last week about mm. peak performances and, and he's come off that, but I, I know he's got a, a better number in him, that's for sure, Romantic Warrior, and it would appear that the market feels that way as well, I suppose, back up to 2000. But you can't what well, you can't quantify when you're doing numbers and looking at data or, or sectionals or anything like that is that will to win, which Golden 60 clearly has. And I mean, he was getting out to a crazy price. I mean, it was a bit of a uh, – Shane didn't want to sort of go either way. He was tipping the Cornella last <laughs> week that it was the right Hey, I took the Cornella. <laughs> <laughs> because the show started early, right, it starts Friday morning, of course. Um, I haven't done as much work as I can. But over the weekend, Richo, I kept looking at the sectional times. And the more I looked at the sectional times, there was no way Romantic Warrior could beat them. And here they are. I'm going to put this up. Now, oh, wow. I kept looking at this. So here's the top 10 times I've ever run, the last 400 metres. Have a look, 21.32, 21.51, down to 22. Oh, so his 10th best time is nowhere near as fast as – it's a lot faster than Romantic Warrior's um, top Fastest time, time, which is 22.31. So I've got in my head all these times, right? I'm thinking, if he's following him, how can he not get beat? He, uh, how can he beat? How can Romantic Warrior win? He can't win. It's impossible. And I kept looking at that last weekend when I did my spreadsheet on sectionals, and it's just impossible. The only way Romantic Warrior could have won if I was riding him last week would have been if they went slow early and I would have gone after I'd seen all that at about the 1,200 to 1,000 and try and got six links in front. And I wouldn't have hesitated doing that. But the way the race unfolded, Takaris couldn't have done that, you know. He was he was bound by the race. And then when James went up and around, it put him in an awkward spot and it actually made the race better for Golden 60. But it was two jockeys who went out there thinking, which is great. I love that. They rode horses according to Lee how they should be ridden to win a race. And um, it was just a fantastic race. And both jockeys did nothing wrong, not a thing wrong. Uh, what we also have to temper those numbers with, and this is the danger when you're reading just into closing sectionals, is how what happens in the first part of a race. Yeah. So it's going to detract from what you can do. Like Golden City has got, clearly got a better turn of foot than, of course, Romantic Warrior. That's pretty obvious. Although the last time they met, there was only eight 100s between their final 200. But when Golden City has been in a lot of races where the tempo has suited him. They've gone softer, so you don't 
have as much. You got he's got plenty to give at the end, and of, and of course that can be tested at the end. On the weekend, he's run about yeah. twenty four seconds, and that's the difference. Strong pace, longer distance. He's gone nowhere near twenty two. So that just taking yeah. closing sections in isolation can be very very dangerous. Can I have a bit of pub chat? Because I love to put up a theory and a discussion point. And Nicole, I love your you to go first. So let's let's envisage we're at neutral ground. Say we're at Royal Ascot, running over a mile. Who would you like to be on, Animo or Golden Sixty? Oh, I've got to stick solid with Golden Sixty, boys. It's that turn of foot, Shane. Same scenario. It's not even a race. Animo would never, ever beat Golden 60. Not in a million years. I don't care what anyone says in Australia. All Vincent would do would sit on his tail and he'd get over him t- over top of him every single race. He, he's, he would have no hope in the world of beating him, Animo, in a mile. Not a hope. But one thing I love about Shane, he doesn't sit on the fence. Well, either did, <laughs> either did Nicole. Nicole was <laughs> straight away. Nicole. But, it, but it's just there. It's fact. It's there. You can see it. If you can't see it, you don't understand. It's as simple as that. That's the way I look at it. Sorry, boys. But he'd beat him every time. This is 1,600 metres. Oh, yeah, and, and I've chosen I've chosen a strong mile, though. It's the straight mile at Ascot in England. as neutral ground. Yeah. It is a little different. I mean, we saw Abel Friend. Not perform well when he went to okay. England at the end of a season, but no, Mile is uh, Golden Sixty is one of those horses that, as Shane has pointed out, I know he's had some races run to suit, but he can sustain a long run. He can reel off a sectional that is incredible, and you know he just has a too good a turn of foot, I think, for that horse. So over a bit of a trip, it might be different though. Two thousand for mine. Okay, another so conundrum. Richard, top. those samples I gave you were over a big span. Most samples yeah. you can only get one or two or three runs. He's broken 22 nine times in races. Uh, there wouldn't be a horse in Hong Kong ever to race that's done that. Not a hope in the world they would have. So he does it regularly. And I, what is he, seven? And he's still doing it regularly. He's done it this season. So yeah. a horse like Animo, he could not beat him. Well, he's a champ. There's no doubting that. Uh, and we should celebrate them both. Both, but he is a champ. Hey, just talking a little Australian with a flavour towards Hong Kong, um, I'll start with you, Shane. Could you imagine Alligator Blood, who's just tough, gelding? Could he be competitive in, say, a champion's mile at the end of the year? Oh, well, he's so tough and he rolls along. He's out of trouble. He's always up there. He can dominate in front and he's very hard to run down. Um, it wouldn't matter what race he runs in, he's going to be competitive, Richo. He'll be competitive, but, Nicole, he'll probably have... Golden 60 on his tail, though. That's the problem, <laughs> isn't it? He usually gives the whiplash when he goes past Jason, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can see what camp she's in. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, he'd have California Spangle up there joining him on speed. But I think, you know, if we take a line through Laws of Indices, who isn't in the same category as a couple of the good milers, but we've got some not bad milers in Australia at the moment, Alligator Blood, mm-hmm. I think Mr Brightside's in pretty good order. Um, if you're taking a line through that particular horse, they would be more than competitive. Alligator Blood's the right kind of horse. He likes to land on speed. Mm. He'll run a big race. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't think. I think they'd both run very respectively. Let's put it that way. So of course, the Triple Trio becomes the Fab Four whenever Nicole's involved. Um, and on the Fab Four, Nick, tell us about the uh, Classic Cup. Gee, this was some win. Uh, that's a serious Hong Kong derby contender now. Yeah, it was a good win by Super Sunny Singh for uh, Vincent Ho uh, for Vincent Ho and Chris So. Vincent had a huge day. Um, the only thing with Super Sunny Singh going into the derby, which makes me a little bit curious as to how he'll behave in the barriers, because I know he can have a tendency to play up a bit. Um, and that 2,000 metre start, the crowd's huge there. They all get amongst it and they're very loud. And with these young horses, you know, you want to keep them calm and quiet before you're heading into the barriers for the biggest race of their career. Um, which actually, Shane, I'd be interested to know as a jockey, like how do you keep them focused, especially if you're riding one that has a temperament like Super Sunny Singh does? Oh, you got to keep them to the fence and back a bit, not on the outside fence where the crowd is. You're so clever picking that up. That's so true. And it's a lot louder than being at the 1,200 down the back. And it is a worry because the, the people around there are screaming and they can hear it. So you just got to keep them around and keep uh, keep them away and try and keep them quiet. But but it is worse there. You're 100% to pick that up. It, it, it can be a problem. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. and the perfect example of that, there was a horse in Australia formerly with um, from France called Glass Harmonium. He would run in the Cox Plate where they'd load in front of a huge crowd and he would play up, miss the kick and blow his chances. He'd come back two weeks later, he'd go to Flemington at the 2,000 metre mark right out the back where it's nice and quiet and he would run unbelievably and win a race like the McKinnon. So Nicole's touched on a really interesting yep. point there. This was a good win, Hutch. I'm glad she brought it up because I wasn't sure. I didn't know about those barrier manners, and it's good information for everyone. Now. But, um, yeah, they still use the – well, in Hong Kong they call it the hood here. They call it the earmuffs, and he's got that piece of gear on, but it hasn't stopped him winning. This was a great win. He, he I didn't think – I had some real doubts. I mean, it's incredible with pedigrees, isn't it, when you've got a Naconia. He's got an all-sprinting pedigree, but – he relaxes, he quickens well. There was a lot of substance to the performance. He, he rallied and he, he put in some good sectionals off a of solid speed. And, yeah, the derby's whittled right down now and he's at the pointy end of it. He's got one there, Nicole, that yeah, might take on. a little bit of beating, but he looks like he is uh, He's going to be. What horse are you referring to, Hutch? What, what horse would that be, Nicole? You can tell by the smile on my face. I'm pumped. I can't <laughs> wait till March 19. <laughs> Beauty Eternal. So he won the uh, mile race on the weekend. Um, he did that in nice style. Um, it actually got me thinking a few weeks ago we had a dinner with Patrick Clock, his owner, and it was just before one of his lead-up races um, and Patrick asked Zach what he thought of the horse and the race and Zach just said very matter-of-factly, I am not afraid of any other horse in this race, Patrick. And I thought that was a very confident comment by Zach but also a very interesting one and we've seen, you know, in his previous couple of starts he's really delivered and, yeah, the team's just excited for, like I said, Derby Day on March 19. Um, it's been a pretty smooth preparation. Now, I say pretty smooth, I think so. Nicole. The one little question you brought <laughs> up about – well, you, you brought up about Super Sunny Singh and the barrier manners, and I know I don't think his manners have been any problem at the barrier. But there was that incident with Zach when he got he got dislodged going onto the track, and it probably mucked around their preparation a bit. Now it might turn out to be a blessing. I'm not sure, but is, is that something to just be mindful of? Is it a one off? Uh, is there anything else that you know about him in terms of his in terms of his temperament? I think he's just cheeky, and obviously it was probably. As much as you never want to see that happen, um, you know, to any horse, let alone one like him before a race, uh, I think it was, you know, it's probably now good that Zach knows what he's capable of and just has to keep him calm on the way to the barriers and keep his mind on the job so that he can, yeah, do what he does. So I, it's just one of those things. We're dealing with animals and, you know, they can get in a mood from time to time. So anyway, that's luckily I'm not writing it. <laughs> I don't like to ride any of them unless they're very, very quiet. <laughs> Shane, how did you how did you rate Beauty Eternal? Um, the best thing about that was the start of the race. Zach used him out of the gates, right? And that takes energy what he did on him early. So he's got more there than people realise, even though he wasn't tested at the end. The day Zach comes out of the gates, if he draws in the derby and puts him to sleep straight away, if he draws in in the derby, he's going to have more uh, energy to quicken. Uh, he's unbeatable. Simple as that. You know, Mars not even have the derby. He wins. And I've been saying that all the time. If he stays, he won't just win the derby. He'll blitz them. You know, it's it's just not even an issue that. But if he runs fourth or fifth, he clearly hasn't stayed. Uh, the horse to beat outside of him is straight Aaron. Now, whether he gets in, the club will put him in for sure, even if he's got enough points. It's not his fault that he hasn't got enough points. It's through circumstances. He's the best horse I've seen come from Australia in a long time to um, Hong Kong to race on what he did in Australia, and I said that from the start of the season. Um, last start was his first run for Casper, so it's an unbelievable training feat, and you've seen what he did. He's got a He's he's a horse that'll go above 100. You don't have to worry about that on his Australian form. So he's the worry in the derby. It's not those other two races, the Classic Mile and the other race. It's 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 straight Aaron. He's he's the worry because we don't know how good he is and what he can do, and he's going to be better at 2,000 than a mile. Yeah, so uh, Hutch, we caught up with uh, Jamie Carr uh, today, and she was riding Voyage Bubble, but uh, concerns about staying Staying the trip, so she might have a different ride when it comes to the dark. Yeah, I believe. Pardon me, that I believe that she um, might be going to ride Galaxy Witness. Okay, um, it's interesting. So, 
And how do you rate them all at the moment? Your your derby rankings week in, week out have been interesting, but you've had one horse pretty constant up the top. Yeah, I couldn't get straight Aaron up where Shane has him, and that's only because the race he came out of the other day was very slowly run and I couldn't upgrade it enough. But, I, you know, he's another horse that's proven over the trip, so you've got to respect him. And at this point in time, it's Beauty Eternal, Sunny Singh, and a gap to the rest. Sword Pointer run well. Galaxy Witness is probably going to do well to run third or fourth. Flagship Warrior got home all right the other day. This is a very interesting runner that runs on the weekend. Alacrity for John so- uh Alacrity for, I thought it might have been for Jamie Richards, but yeah. um, Alacrity ran against Beauty Eternal, carried top weight, was dragged back from the, the stalls, reeled off some of the best closing sectionals of the day with top weight, is a Chilean import, believe it or not, mm-hmm. who won a Breeders' Cup, over, uh, I think, in that country of origin over a distance. Really, really interesting runner. I think um, it'll be looking, watching with him with some interest on the weekend. He's raced 10 number one on Sunday over 1,600 metres. Uh, Nicole, you won't you won't be there. You'll be staying in Sydney uh, with Zach. So Zach's not riding on Sunday? No, he's not. So he took his suspension uh, Sunday and the following Wednesday. So we'll stay in Sydney for a few days, catch up with friends. Zach's riding tomorrow uh, at Randwick. Um, yeah, and we'll just enjoy a few days here and then head back to Hong Kong. And it must be so pleasing for you to catch up with family. People people forget the, the life that you guys have led and, and COVID, the impact that it had in Hong Kong. It's the first time Zach's riding in Randwick for five years. It is. Um, yeah, COVID's thrown us a bit. My friends and my sister especially keeps laughing that every shop I go in, it's like I'm a tourist, like, I, you know, the grocery store or the seafood stores. It's like I've forgotten a bit of Sydney. So it's so nice to be back. And, yeah, the, like you said, Zach hasn't ridden here for ages, so he's really looking forward to that. And yeah, we'll just soak up all the time we have in Sydney and then, yep, head back to Hong Kong. And, and back to work and back to uh, doing what he does absolutely uh, best uh, Jane, you saw Hutchie's rankings in regards to uh, the, the Hong Kong Derby. You agree with them all? Oh, definitely. That's how you rank them in order. Now, why I've got um, uh, straight Aaron so high is because it's not on his last win, right? Because it was class three, they didn't go fast, and it wasn't a strong race. So I can understand why Clint can't put him up there. I go on what I feel, and I know what he could do in Australia, and I've been bringing that up on the show for the last what, four months since he started racing. So if he reaches what he can do in Australia, there's no risk he's going to run in the first three in, a, in the derby for sure if he do- goes on how he did in Australia. And that's why I've got him so high. And now he's with Casper, who must have turned him around with that win, as you've seen. He can only improve. So um, that's why I've got him so high. But if you're going on rankings, ratings in Hong Kong, you can't have him there. No, but I think you 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 know you pointed him out, Shane, and what a great effort it was from Cass as well. 40 pounds he knocked off that horse in terms of body weight. Didn't have a, a lot of weeks. I think about three Four, and a half weeks he weeks. turned him around. But he, he jumped, travelled. It was a sweet win, and he would have won by further had he had he got out sooner. So it was a, he looked a different horse. and. You know, you might be under, you know, might be under something there, and you'll probably still get a good price about him on the day. The mm. two training performances of the season are, of course, Danny Shim with uh, Romantic Warrior, two thousand meters first and second up, and that there was outstanding from Casper, what he did to turn that horse around in four weeks. Brilliant stuff. Uh, hey, Nicole, have a great time in Sydney, reconnecting with family and friends, and we love what you're doing for us with the Triple Trio. Thanks heaps. Thanks, guys. Great to have Nicole Purton joining us uh, to give us the insights. And by gee, doesn't Zach sound confident with that beauty eternal backing up everything that Hutchie has said? Let's find out who has been sweet into defeat. They're off. And Sugar Sugar missed the start by four lengths. Then Dublin star, Sugar Sugar fast, Buck Smart leader. Oversubscribe, lunges at the post. Missed. Sugar Sugar. That's a sweet win for Alfie Chan. Our black booker here on the Triple Trio is called the Sweet in Defeat file. Hutch, we're in your hands. Yeah, a couple from the last week, and I thought there was a, a nice newcomer on Saturday who we did actually play round the globe. Wasn't good enough. I thought that it was still a very good run in defeat, and he probably could have finished closer had a different path be taken, but it was still a nice run from round the globe. And I've got a question. I mean, I know um, Shane put up Tony as um, he's – Slaughter Tony Cruz that is as, as he slaughtered last week. I all I want Tony to do, please Tony, can you run California deeply over twelve hundred 
and I think he'd be really suited by a senior rider as well. This is a very good horse, Shane, California Deeply. I think you talked about getting to triple figures. I think this guy is on the heels of some of the better sprinters we got going around. I think he'd be better at Chartin. I'm sure he'd be better at 1,200. And he, I know Tony keeps running him here over 1,000, but he just can't keep up. But God, he's got an unbelievable turn. He actually needed one around him at the rock, you know, to hit him and yeah. get him travelling, and the kid couldn't pick him up and get him travelling. But you're correct, he finished strongly and he just wants further. It, well, it looks like he does anyway, you know. He, he, his just close keeps chasing, doesn't he? fantastic, and you're correct, um, Clint. Yeah, he just keeps He just it. keeps wanting to chase. Yeah. And In fact, the, he chased for 1,000 metres. He was hard at him for 1,000 metres, chasing, chasing, chasing. Well, he just, yeah, I, I think a senior rider would be better in a little bit of a trip. Oh. Imagine what, when he can actually travel in a race as well, how, you know, he'll let down like he does. I mean, he's putting together those finishes which are a number of times. So California Deep League, Tony, please go to 1,200, and um, I think that round the globe will win one soon too. Tony, you know it makes sense. Vineyards are slaughtered. They sweep for home now. Vianda Cross has come very wide. Vianda Cross answering the urgings of Shane Dyke. Mannerism coming at him. Mannerism has got it. Daring tactics by Shane Dye. He's got octagonal in full flight on the corner. Bold tactics by Shane Dye are going to pay off and he pinches the chipping Norton. Shane Dye, the Hall of Fame jockey, uh, takes a look at the weekly rides in Hong Kong. And RS, let's start with Genius. Who caught your eye? There were a couple. The first one, I'm not going to play it simple. It was uh, Luke Ferraris on Al Creed. He led in the first, went slow, quickened up before the rock at the right time, got a break of four leaks, lengths, and uh, he won, hung on and won, rated him really well in that. This is a very good ride, this one I'm going to play. This is Atomic Force Gate 9. Now, this horse has been going hard in races and can lead. It was his first run for a while, Harry Bentley, but he just got him relaxed back and he didn't want to stay off the fence, which was perfect. He come to the fence and he ends up on the fence which is just perfect here. Yeah. So many horses now are winning on the fence at Happy Valley across. But not only that, he's following Zach, who's on the second favourite. There was two main chant. Well, there was three glorious fatality, but really two main. One is California Deeply, who uh, Clint's mentioned out the back, and the other one is um, Zach's ride in the white and um, blue. And he follows him, and he doesn't panic. And watch the head on. He's following the one to beat. He's following him, and he doesn't have to do anything until he's ready. Now he pops out, and he he saved all the energy in the world and he said, let's go. And he quickens to just get up and win. Clint, that was a really, really good ride. Yeah, it yeah, was. Really it was. Right. And look, I couldn't have found him. He turned around, as um, Shane had mentioned, he hadn't had a run in a while and I, I didn't, I, he hadn't been performing that well for me, obviously. Casper put him away, changed a few things around, got oh. him going well, but I thought he was a, hard, a very hard one to find. Hey, <laughs> also, with Triple Trio, we're keen to educate our audience. You keep saying, You've said a couple of times before, the rock educate our audience is what you mean there? Okay, so down the back at Happy Valley, it's called the rock because it goes up and it's like a rock. Um, and what happens in Happy Valley, so the track's level as you go into the back, but then it goes down like this and then it shoots up and it's really steep, but you can't really see it on TV. But if you walk the track, you'll go, oh, my God, and that's called the rock where it goes up and it's it's steep. Where that is, there is a big rock there. Yeah, as and well. And it's about 700 metres, six to 700 metres out. That'd be about right, Shane? Yeah, it about it's about six, 700, 700 metres. Yeah, it's it's at least it's seven hundred to seven fifty, I'd say. Oh, great insight! Uh, slaughter. Who was the slaughter this week? This was one that no one would realise, and um, this is exceptional. Nice. Now I'm going to take you through the race and tell you why. This is Matthew Chadwick. This should have won for sure. This was my bet of the night. Maybe I'm talking through my pocket, but I'm not. There was no pace in this race. There was only two horses that could lead. One is Lyle Ewison on Red Majestic, and there there was nothing that could take him on apart from expe exceptional nice. Now, all he had to do was sit outside of him and he wins for sure, but he comes back a length and a half. You've got to do your homework. Why are you coming back? They've run 29 seconds, right, which is walking. They walked. You can't go. He's let the favourite go up and around outside the leader. The race is over. You cannot win now. You're not going to beat the favourite with the run he's having. And when you're on a horse who has placed over 2,200, placed over 1,800, you've got to be outside the leader in a slow run race. Now, if you know Lyle Hewitson, 
He never goes too fast and he rates them well in front, right? He's probably one of the best in front, but he never goes fast. You've given away your advantage in the race to the favourite. Matthew, you've been riding really well, but you didn't think here. And you should have before the race because I would have gone out there to lead or sit outside of him. And that's why I backed this horse. I had him favourite and he was $18, yet I had him favourite because of the way the race was going to be run. And I thought he could dominate on pace where chances were going to get back and had no hope. Now you watch him in the straight, he just keeps coming coming. Watch Red Majestic. He's going no good before this. He had no hope in the world of winning. He's out of form, but he still battles on because he's walked. The first three home are the first four all the way, and he just keeps going. Like, he should have won, Clint, but that's doing your homework before the race and thinking to myself and going, right, there's one leader, Lyle. I'm going to come across, sit outside of him. If he's going too slow, I'm on an 1800-2 to horse. I'll go to the front. But they could have dominated that race and there's no way Teton would have gone up and around because he would have had to go to the front too fast but by Matthew coming back off the other horse it gave Teton a chance to whip up and around with an easy run on the favourite and he wins the race before because of it. You've got to be thinking before the race, every race, and that's a classic example. Um, Matthew missed the boat and didn't put enough homework into that race and he's been so, riding really well. Shane, we see, I see, you see a lot in Australia, probably more than Hong Kong, but jockeys do what Matthew did quite often. They don't mind taking a sit. I think they think that little spot with cover was going to be better than then controlling it from outside the lead. Why are so many riders now um, attuned to doing that, do you think? I had an argument the other day with the bloke. He doesn't want to be outside the leader. I said, give me outside the leader every race, half a length off him or neck off him. He said, mate, no, you're doing too much. I said, I'd take it every race. But they want to be with cover, one back, one out. And that was never the case with that horse in that race. That didn't even enter my mind. And when they went past the winning post, uh, because I backed him, I'm following him. I had a really good bet on him. I thought he'd win for sure, and he was eighteen or nineteen dollars. Um, I'm going, Matthew. What are you doing? What are you? Why are you coming back? Stay forward. You're walking. You're not even going fast. It's different if you're going fast, Clint. But then the sectionals come up the top of the TV, and it had twenty nine point one five or something, or twenty eight nine five. You don't go slower than that at Happy Valley. Normally, it's around twenty seven seven. So they've gone about. I'd say eight lengths slower than normal. So they were walking, and he gave the race to the other horse, just gave it to him. Oh, brilliant stuff, mate. Hey, what about – tell us about sectionals of True Legend. Uh, you've analysed Oh, them. this is another one, True Legend. Like I was on him last week because of – now here's the sectionals, and I brought this up when he raced last time, and this is why sectionals are so important, right? And this is what decides races. Have a look at the kid here. Um, he's come out, he's run a 28-1-2, then a 23-4-2, right? The start before he's gone a 27-2-5, a 22-2-1. Now that, if you add it up, is what's that, Clint, two seconds? Mm -hmm. Two seconds yeah, faster? Well, he's gone 12 lengths faster the start before, and you wondered why he stopped in the straight. Um, and that's why he won this week because they didn't go fast. They went slow. Even when he got taken on here, he wasn't too bad. But then they quickened up and run a 22.77, which meant that the back markers now can't win because they did it at about the 800 metres and it puts them out of the race. He was never going to get beat this, this horse once they did that early. And this is why sectionals are so important early in races if you can get away. If you have a look at the top one, he looks home. Uh, but because he's wasted so much energy early going too fast, he stops and he runs 1,650 every start, this horse. He looks home here on the top one, but the sectionals start to kick in and because he's gone on so quick early when he didn't need to, he paddles the last bit, but down here because he's gone so slow early, uh, he can still kick and he won the race very, very well. He, he was a really good bet, this horse, last week in this race. Um, yeah. because of what he had, what happened the start before. And that's a good example of races can be won or lost with sectionals early in the race, and you just got to have a clock in your head and know. And it comes down with experience, and that's what we get with RS. Yeah. But well, the good job is to make those right decisions early. Yeah. I think the really good ones, they can tell if they're going a bit quick or if they're not, and then acting on it. 
what I find frustrating probably when you hear sometimes is when writers come back and go, oh, they went too slow. Yeah. And it was like, well, why didn't you do something about yeah, that's it? That's right. What did you why s- don't they, Shane? Why, why when they go, oh, they get, went too slow, why does no one take off? Well, he's going to tell you us about chip, the Chipping Norton on Octagonal. He <laughs> took off. No, no, I'll tell you why, right? Um, people are scared to lose, right? I was never scared to lose. you got to dare to dream. And a young man that's daring to dream at the moment, he's travelling the entire world riding class horses, is Damien Lane. He's our special guest. Let's chat all things global racing and uh, the racing world was centred on Saudi Arabia last weekend for the Saudi Cup and uh, Damien Lane, who's a great friend of the show, was over riding and captured a Group 3 and Frosty, congratulations on that ride. Great to have you on the show, mate. What was it like riding in uh, Saudi Arabia? Thanks, Richo. Uh, it was a great night. It was great to get a result and um, yeah, it was great to be a part of the meeting. It was it's a very unique, um, very unique meeting. Obviously, a big, uh, rich race meeting in the in the middle of the desert. And um, yeah, it was the race meeting itself was was really good. It was run really well, and and um, it was it was great not to be a part of. Damien, congratulations on the win. You must have been happy with the run arounds you had. You basically sat on the the leader's back and just need a little bit of luck at a key stage. But Silver Sonic was terrific. It was terrific. Uh, I was aided by a good draw. I drew barrier one. As soon as the barriers come out, I knew that was going to be a big help. Uh, although it's the stretches are quite long on the turf there in Riyadh, the top the the corners are quite tight. So you, you're turning, you know, at each end of the race course quite hard for a significant amount of distance. So I think it favours inside draw and inside draws. And I was able to switch him off behind the lead there and. I uh, just needed a little bit of luck at, at a crucial stage. He was fantastic, mate. What about the Saudi Cup? Uh, Japan win the Saudi Cup. Uh, your horse ran well, but uh, once again, we show see the power of these Japanese horses. Yeah, it was a great race. I was a little bit sceptical whether the Japanese horses would line up this year, especially to the horses from the US. Uh, I guess they probably maybe didn't get as many horses from around um the the world is what it what it normally does uh hence i think why there was you know six japanese runners in it uh but they really they proved that they are, I, I just thought the japanese dirt horses might have been a couple of lengths off and um but it, they proved that they weren't and they they filled for the top five spots i think it was and and uh obviously country grammar running second da- damien what's it like um that surface that Artificial, that sand surface or the dirt surface that they have there in Saudi. And how does that compare? Obviously, got Super Saturday this weekend. We've got the Dubai World Cup coming up. How, what's the, is there any sort of correlation between the two or do they ride differently? What, 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 can, what info can you give us there? Um, only having limited experience on um, dirt tracks outside of Japan, I, it, it is very different to Japan's dirt. Uh, I'd say it's more similar to Dubai than than to Japan. It was more sort of clay base. Uh, it rode quite well. Uh, it, was a, it was a big spacious track, uh, but the surface rode really well. It was the kickback probably wasn't as severe as what the Japanese dirt is. Uh, and, and it was probably more like, more like the Dubai surface. So hopefully that means that they'll all handle it going on to Dubai. Shane, what's incredible is, once again, these Japanese horses that are travelling all around the world, just how strong Japan racing is. It's very strong. It was getting stronger once the Japan Cup started in the late 80s and they just wanted to turn it into the best in the world. But I'm sure Damien's a better judge than me with their horses, but when I rode there in the early 90s and that, I found their horses were bigger, stronger, and they were colts and stallions. Um, is it still like that there, Damien, the, the, the strong and muscular? Yeah, it's very rare for a horse to be gelded there um, and, you know, it'd be in, 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 there'd only be a few percent that are, whereas here we obviously it's the other way around. So uh, I think that does have some some effect. I mean, the horses are, as you said, they're big, strong horses. They're quite lean still because they stay in work all the time. There's There's not many horses that actually spell. They'll just go back to the... Training farms and tick over trot and canter 
Uh, so they stay in work nearly all the time and uh, so they stay lean but muscular and they're, they're, they're good size imposing figures. Keen to bet into the world pool, which is uh, Super Saturday, which you've mm. just touched on, Hutch, in uh, Maidan. So uh, Damien Lane won't be there for this meeting, but then he will be for the World Cup, which we'll have a look at a couple of his rides in a moment. But we've got some interest from Hong Kong, Senior Tober and also Russian Emperor. Yeah, Senior Tober, of course. Um, he, I mean, he's a real stayer, as we know. Russian Emperor, fantastic. They lined up against each other in in Saudi the week before the main meeting, and, of course, Russian Emperor won there. And interestingly, Douglas has brought him back to 1800. For the Jebel Hatter, um, but you'd imagine he'll step back up in trip for the main event or Dubai World Cup night, and obviously Senor Toba over the mile and a half. That'll be perfect. probably in his uh, his sweet spot as well. That'd be absolutely perfect. And then Frost, we look forward to World Cup night. Gee, you got the frequent flyer points going up at the moment, mate. Uh, they must be just banking up back to uh, the Middle East. You must be looking forward to the book of rides you've got there. Yeah, for sure. Really looking forward to getting back to Dubai again this year. I rode on the card last year, the World Cup meeting. It was it was a great experience and I was lucky enough to ride a winner and this year I go back with some really handy mounts. So very much looking forward to that. And our audience will know when Marilyn well. Of course, you won in Hong Kong aboard her, Damien, and, uh, and Sarah Foss, a horse that we probably as Australian not as well acquainted with, but... You know, you've got this association with and um, probably in, in a bit of a, a sort of lease grocheur type mould. Um, how, how, how good do you think Seraphos could be? He could be really good. He's, he's I'd like to say he might be untapped yet. His last start was an incredible win in the Champions uh, Mile in, in Japan. Uh, he was, he's now just turned four, so he, he could keep improving. The stable... I've seen someone from the stable in Saudi and they said he's come back in great order. They, they said themselves he might have even improved. So if that's the case, he could have he could really go to another level. He was he was great in his two year old year. He just struggled for a couple of three year old runs. And when I say struggle, he ran two fourths in, in group one. So um that's how good his form was prior to that. And then he came out at the back of the end of his three year old year and won a uh, group two or group three and then and then come out and won a group one really well uh it was a shame he didn't he was thinking about coming to hong kong at the end of the year but he didn't want to overtax him so he set him for this at the start of this year and uh this has been the plan for a long time so expecting to be running really well on the night and it was also interesting news um as we're talking all thing global racing that uh, we are going to have some japan horses arrive for the championships in sydney in australia unicorn lion i think uh, frosty is one of those that's going to be coming out for Yoshida Yahagi, and we know how well he travels horse. Yeah, he's a freak. Uh, he tra- he had trained two more winners on Saudi Cup night, Bathrat Leon, and also the Saudi Cup winner in Pantalasa. They both go on to Dubai now as well. Um, he brings two horses out that are probably certainly not quite that level to Australia, Unicorn Lion and Ho-Ho Amazon, but um, they're handy, handy horses uh, on their day, and... Uh, you could never, you could never dismiss one of his runners. He's just wherever he travels at the moment, he seems to have success. Yeah. Have you got the hand up? Will you be booked to ride? Uh, not booked as yet. Um, <laughs> <see>. Working on it. <laughs> <laughs> not booked as yet, but available, mate. I know you've got a, a big day tomorrow, mate. Good luck with everything that's happening in in world racing for you. Uh, we just thought we'd quickly. Grab you on the line to reflect on Saudi Arabia and look forward, of course, to Maidan. Always brilliant to catch up. Thanks, guys. The one and only Damien Lane, part of our global racing. <music> Let's find some winners on Sunday. Uh, Hutch, we start with you. Uh, can I... Fast forward all the way through to race eight. How have you analysed that? Yeah, it's a tough race. Actually, the whole card on the weekend isn't going to be all that easy, but that's why we call on you and Hutchie's honkers. Yes, well, hopefully there'll still be some nice opportunities, and I'm sure there will. But look, there's a horse here. We've been talking about tempo and pace and et cetera like that. There's a horse down the bottom called Champion Dragon. A lot. We, we made a good case for him last start. I know Shane thought he could win as well, and that was a classic case of a rider, and I think on that occasion it was Angus Chung. He just went too slow on him. He had no weight on his back. He should have gone forward. And I'm really hoping that Matt Chadwick 
can roll at a decent tempo because they didn't end this race. And this was a race where 5G Patch was out sprinted by Running Glory, of course, and Butterfield. But this race, Shane, that we're looking at, I'm hope I don't think it'll be the same sort of race shape. And I think whilst Running Glory is very consistent and Butterfield's probably nearly ready to win. I think with a lightweight, if they ride Champion Dragon, as they should, he will take a lot of reeling in. He definitely made two mistakes on him last start, Champion Dragon. One was out of the gates. He wasn't positive. The other two horses did not want to lead. They wanted him to lead, but he just kept coming back. And the other one was out the 600. He did the right thing, come off the fence, but he didn't attack at the 600. He waited. And that horse has not got a sectional. He's just very one-paced. He should have won for sure. Um, he's got a great chance. And the best thing about it is the barrier. He's got gate nine, and gate 10 is and 11 probably won't pressure, press, pressure him early. So he can bide his time and just go to the front when he wants, and he's got a great chance. It's not an easy race, though, Clint. There's a few in there. Spirit no. Express is racing well. Butterfield, running glory, had everything go right the other day to win. The Irishman's racing well. But per champion Dragon's going up two classes, more or less, or a class, but he's going to be very hard to beat. Yeah, I think if they, they're they going to be positive, they've got to ride in that way. I think Butterfield's a good Cornella chance, and I'm not sure what to do with the Irish, but I think he's definitely going better now, Shane. I think you're right there, and he could park just – I mean, I surprised me the other day when he just jumped well, parked straight in behind them, and, and it was a good win, and he's starting to deliver some of that early promise. And like you said, Spirit Express come up good on my numbers as well, but hopefully we'll be able to have something on Champion Dragon. We move to race number nine, and it's over 1,200 metres on Sunday, and uh, this is on the all-weather. It is on the all-weather. I've, I've marked this, uh, priced this race up. It's an interesting of, um, race from the perspective, Shane, that a lot of the form for each one of for this race, the vast majority of the runners competed on the same day, so we get an idea comparing times, overall times, and Adderfield, of course, won by six in his race in a lower class. But, of course, in from that same day, we had Flying Dragon uh, beat Fiery Diamond, amongst others. The others that were in, there was a number of others that were in that particular contest. Lightning Number Bolt two. was there, Man Star, well, Elon. Well, this is Addy Phil. I'm going to have him pretty short priced out. The, the, key, the key factor here, Shane, is that he ran better time on the same day as most of his rivals, and now he drops five kilos in weight. The barrier won't be a problem, and I'm expecting him to, if he holds this sort of form and he's only had a couple of goes on the dirt, he's going to take a lot of beating. The margin looks impressive then. It was, but that said, you know, if he was in the other race, I think he's only about a length and a half or a length or so faster or better than them, but he gets a five-kilo allowance as well this time. Um Tat Karras was very naughty. He's cost him a win, actually, by riding him out to the line. He didn't need to. And he's one by six, and he was ridden right out, so he can't go any faster. He's going to be very hard to beat at the weights, but there's one in there that'll give him a shake, and that's Lightning Bolt. His win two starts ago was very good. He should have won for sure last start. Yui couldn't get a run on him. He was back, and he went to the line hard held. He's going to be very hard to beat Lightning Bolt, especially if they go along here from gate four. He's going to track up nice. But Edifield's been penalised two wins for his last win, and, of course, he's gone to class three. I think he got 12 points, Clint, for that. You know, and he didn't need to get 12 points. He was always going to win. Um, but he's going to be very hard to beat with 115 pounds, gate nine, out of trouble, and he just keeps rolling. You know, he's gone at the 600, and you think he's gone, and he just keeps going. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he won again, but the Quinella Lightning Bolt. Uh, we're at race number 10, Hutch. Good race this. Now, we have referenced the final event already yes. with Alacrity. I'm, I'm intrigued with this horse. I really am. With I, I haven't seen much form from Chile, and – Obviously, that first up run was fantastic, actually, behind Beauty Eternal, where they were negative out of the gates. I'm a little disappointed that they drew 13 again because I presume they'll probably ride in the same way. I'm hoping they're not as negative. Can Beauty Inspire improve? Um, they went for, he led up the other day for Luke Curry, sort of the, didn't seem to have too many options, but Hugh Bowman now probably takes a sit. Ching on number 12, he was unlucky last start when held up, and now he goes up in class. And drops him weight. Now here's a lacrity, Shane. I've said my my two bobs worth. Um, this was a very good run. Yes, he did run well, Clint. This is a good race. This is quite a few chances in this, and there'll be pace on you would think with massive action in there. Um, he hit the line well, and um, no, it was a very good run. Of course, that was his first Hong Kong start. Mm -hmm. King's Capital was in the same race. Interestingly, King's Capital can map a lot closer here, and 
His last couple of runs haven't been too bad. He's going to be the sort of 20 to 1, I think, or maybe 12 to 20 to 1 knockout in this race. Um, he'll be at price because he's been there a long time and they won't be looking too strongly at him. But if you're playing a quaddy or a yeah. treble or something oh, wow. like that, you would want to put him in. But Alacrity looks a, a very good chance in the race. I think Harvin Nagila will improve as well. I have had a good look at the race. Beauty inspires a key runner, Shane, because he was obviously excellent first up for J-Mac when he didn't have a lot of speed, drew wide, they went back. I think just through circumstances, Luke ended up leading the other day and it probably didn't suit those. He stopped. They, they didn't find anything wrong with him, but I'm pretty sure they'll revert to giving him a bit of a chance early. Beauty Inspire will 100% go better. I'd be astounded if he didn't. He's going to run a race. Havana and Glare or whatever you call it. Richo, that's one for you to pronounce, not me. The five. <laughs> you did a good job, actually, uh, Harvin Aguila. You did yeah. it perfectly. Yeah, you, you've come a long way. So you've got beauty in spot. Um, no, um, Havana Naglera should have won last start, I thought. I th thought he didn't get the right ride to win the race. He's going to run a race. And um, I'm I'm quite big on um, Ching down the bottom from gate six with 118. He should have won last start for sure. All he needs is a bit of room and he's a nice horse. And the way this race is going to be run with 118 pounds, he's not going to stop. He's going to keep coming looking at this. So um, Clint's right with the toppy. He's got gate 13, though, with 135 pounds, so he's going to need a bit of luck getting in with the right run. But um, that's about it in that, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. Hutchie's honkers, of course, for all the full analysis uh, from the best in the business and Clint Hutchison and our big team for what's going to be a fantastic day of racing on Sunday. Arch Buster, this is when I grab you and Shane and whack your arms up your back and demand the best bet out of you. We had one in our make our sweet and defeat file a couple of weeks ago, a horse called uh, Inspire City, who runs around for David Hayes earlier in the day. Race four, number two now. I don't think they'll get that far back on him. He's been entered in a couple of races that haven't been suitable lately. He's got that drop in class. I'm expecting him to settle a heck of a lot closer from gate one. The weakest race that he has found. And I think that race four, number two, Inspire City can win. I will be having a Quinella in that last race as well. I thought that Alacrity, Beauty, Inspire, and Ching, as uh, Shane mentioned, I think those One, are the two and twelve. Those are the three key runners there. And I'll be having something hopefully on Champion Dragon if he comes up the right price. Race eight, the number he might be number ten, is he? Race you know, eight, horse number ten in Champion Dragon. Champion Dragon. If you don't mind. Mm. RS Die is a champion and you're a dragon. So um, what do you think, Jane? Um, for Fito in race six, it'll win again, but it's going to be short looking at this. It's going to be odds on. It's got to be odds on. So that's no good, but he should be winning race six, number two. And let's go. That is Perfetto. Perfetto. Uh, this is a hard race. This is a good, this is the best race of the day, the best field. Race three, right? The sprint, 1,200 metres. This is a really good race, Clint. You know, there's good one horses in this. I'm going to go rewarding together. He should have won last start. He's racing well, but it's a hard race. But just that 12 pounds off a of Curia Wonder and Duke Y might help him. And there's a lot of pace in that race with Campione going, Nervous Witness going, and he'll be back a bit, but he'll be charging. So who have you got on? top there rewarding together what did you rewarding, have on top there clint um i've got to finish the race off but he, he i've made him a bet off in that horse and he's he i love him i think he's very tough and consistent and he can win it the one thing i'll say though and i'll probably um have something on him but frankie law we was looking at the stats last night shane and uh he's going at about six percent his last hundred and his normal average is double that is the stable just a little bit below par at the moment I've got no idea. I don't take much notice unless it sticks out. Like I, I didn't actually notice that, Clint, you know. Mm. It's like when I do replays of horses, I look at the horse, I don't know who's on it, then I look at the half the time and then I look at who's on it, you know, same as training. I'm more worried about the horse than trainers and jockeys. Yeah, but I do notice it and I only look, look at, at it when it's sort department. of stands. That's Clint, you keep all the stats and you're very yeah. good at it in ratings. So that's my <laughs> yeah. department. No, but I do. It does. Stables they don't change their system through the no. year, but they have peaks and troughs generally. <laughs> well, that's true. That's one hundred percent true. They go up and down, and you know yeah. when they're in form, and you know when they're out of form. I yeah. think I, I just noticed that when Keefe dropped off a cliff after looking so impressive early in the season, he's gone. I don't know what's happened there, and I noticed a, a few others in the yard. Look, Frankie's a great trainer. He's last yeah. season's champion trainer, but I don't want to be with him strongly if the, if the stable a little bit out of form. 
I'm sort of a little bit more tempered. It is something that I do consider. You're not out of form. You just got to keep up your good form. That's your challenge this week. We've won the last couple. If just I, keep it going. If I was going half as well as Shane is going, yeah. Oh please. All I'd say is, if you'd seen I'll take me at that. poker on what was it <laughs> Tuesday night, you wouldn't have been. <laughs> RS as always, an absolute pleasure working with you, my friend. Good luck on Sunday. See you later, boys. Good luck to everyone. All the best. Do good. Good luck, Hutchbuster. Yep, Make you. sure you tune in. Hutchies honkers, jump on. Uh, you get all the best analysis in the business. If you're watching us on Seven Plus, thank you. Wherever the uh, rest of the world, hopefully you're tuning in through uh, YouTube. We'll do it all again next week.